Killer. Well, dude, I, I can't thank you enough for the time. And uh, it, this is really kind of a uh, a death fan dream come true. This tour you've put together, the scream of perseverance, giving us two nights, basically doing the whole catalog. One night of eighties on Thursday, June the twenty seventh, and then the next night, kind of more the nineties set with cryptopsy cryptopsy opening. And I'm curious, man, are you doing this uh, set? These sets in sequence? Like you're gonna play scream bloody uh, gore in sequence like the album or are you going to mix up the set a little bit well what we are doing is um both nights feature the entirety of each album right uh we've got uh you know in scream bloody gore on the first night in its entirety and it is also mixed with just a whole ton of other death songs from the albums that surround it you know kind of like from that brutal area of you know leprosy and spiritual healing we're doing a number of tracks off of both of those and then you know the entirety of scream bloody gore and then on the second night we do the same thing with with the sound of perseverance play that in its entirety and also kick ass tracks from uh from human individual thought patterns uh symbolic so it's a it's definitely a killer night of a killer pair of nights for for absolute death fans or, or just music fans in general metal fans you know it's like i've i've been telling everybody it's like you do not want to be the guy that gets the phone call the next day going where were you holy jesus you know the, what a great night you know you missed it kind of thing we got some killer players you know we got bobby coble on guitar and steve de giorgio on yeah. bass and max phelps does a fantastic job you know being the being the voice and the the chuck guitars so it is really really killer man i tell you i i can't thank you enough as a fan for doing this i mean you're really covering every era there, there's no no room for complaint and it must be nice as an artist to be in in one venue for two nights in a row you don't have to pack up your drums that, that, that night you get to stay in town for a day or two fair enough hey that that's never uh you know having a little mini residency is never never you know it's never it's all it's always good you know you always like that sort of thing you know it, it makes it easier on the crew and uh yeah so that that's pretty fun you know getting to it does change the dynamic of touring a bit from from the working aspect of it you know the next day you're you know you don't have to do all the things that you did the day before kind of thing you know all the right. all the pre-show kind of thing so that's pretty darn fun i tell you get to explore the town a little bit more i imagine <laughs> i wish holy moly yeah that's it's been a while since i've gone town exploring so uh but like for instance you know as we speak we are in vancouver canada right at the moment and um, I've got my good my good friend Ash Pearson is here and he's driving the rest of the death to all guys around Vancouver, showing them a little bit of Vancouver because it's a beautiful town here. And so they get to explore. I, I get to work. You, get to work. <laughs> you know, right. going back into the to the past and talking death, talk to me about getting the gig in death. Talk to me about that transition from Dark Angel to getting the gig in death, if you wouldn't mind. Well, what, how that really, how that transpired was back in, um, in late fall of 1992, Dark Angel had just, you know, sort of, I guess, like just dissolved sort of thing. You know, it's not, we didn't like break up or anything like that. It just, it just wasn't going to happen. It was, it was definitely an uphill battle um, with the current state of thing, how things were with the record industry, with the recording industry, and, and just with how how the band's future was going to go, so I was speaking with with Boravoy Kurgan from from Blabbermouth, and um, you know I was entering a new phase of of trying to find a vocalist, and uh, you know Boravoy is a uh, you know he's he's a man that's been on the scene as as long as I have kind of thing. Um, we we went back a number of years before that and he reached out one day and said hey i was just speaking with chuck and you know you're looking for a band chuck's looking for a drummer what do you think about you know check you know checking out you know having a conversation with chuck and chuck and i had known each other for years and years you know pushing a decade we were pen pals back in the day kind of thing on the tape trading scene so I knew Chuck and we had just done a, a, a number of shows together a couple of years earlier. And um, 
so I said, you know, I reached out the Chuck reached out to me. I reached out to Chuck, however it went. And it was pretty quick. You know, it was like, yeah, man, we just had a kick-ass conversation. And by the end of the conversation, Chuck was like, I've got this, this riff tape that I want to send you and check it out and see what you think. And, you know, maybe put some ideas together for yourself. And what do you think about, you know, recording this, this next record with us? And so that how that's how that transpired. It was, you know, a couple wow. of quick phone calls and then I was on a on a plane not too long after that kind of thing. And you know, if I was hoping you could kind of uh humanize Chuck. I mean, we all know what a great player he was and vocals and, and the creation of death metal, but kind of humanize him for me if you can. Was he a silly guy? Was he a practical joker? Did he have mm-hmm. a movie and ice cream flavor? Kind of take me back well, and him. Well, definitely. I mean, Chuck was actually, you know, at at his heart, you know, he was always, he, he was a very complicated man, but at his heart, he was a pretty gentle guy and he had a great sense of humor. You know, he had a very dry sense of humor. He would always drop some line after something that had just happened. Chuck would usually have a good, uh, uh, just a good period at the end of whatever that thing that just happened was. And Chuck, Chuck was a pretty gentle dude. He, you know, he loved metal. And, you know, as far as the, like the creation of death metal, he was definitely a big part of it, obviously, but, you know, he, he was never comfortable with the, with the, the moniker of the godfather of death metal, like he was being, you know, touted as that, that, that never resonated very well with him because, you know, he loved bands like Possessed and, you know, and Slayer and, you know, Versal Fate and Venom and all the, all the stuff we all, we all already loved. And, you know, he allowed those influences to show definitely in the early stuff, like you do when you're, you know, in your teens writing music, you know, your influences are definitely real, you know, a lot more apparent. And then, you know, as, as he evolved, it, he was evolving away from that, that young teenage dude that he was, you know, he was like, I, I love metal and I love, I love writing and what I need to do to make myself really happy is I have to write for myself. Um, and that's when you started seeing sort of the the next extension of death evolving past the the brutality and the gore. And that's when, you know, when when Sean Reiner and Paul Masvidal ended up playing on Human that really elevated the, the the musical caliber definitely you know those guys are some monster players and cynic. um ha- yeah yeah the cynic guys totally and um having Sean's fantastic drum work on on human preceding what i was you know my ideas for for individual thought patterns that was that was a great template laid for for the drums anyway so i was able to really go sick and go nuts as chuck liked to say but you know that's where he was starting to evolve into like kind of a more melodic style and by the time you know symbolic was coming out individual and symbolic i mean there were a lot of the old school hardcores that were like hey man what the hell happened to you guys you know what happened to death you know what happened to scream bloody gore leprosy and all that sort of stuff and chuck was like i i have to write for me you know kind of thing that's that's i i i can't pay that much attention to what people are saying kudos to that because as an artist you you really can't you know it's like you write for yourself i do you know i write for myself if people like it great if they don't no no sorry you know kind of thing but chuck at his heart was a pretty gentle guy you know he loved he loved animals as you can tell he always had a kitty shirt on you know and i mean there are that's pretty famous. Some of his acknowledgement of animals and, you know, how, how important they were to him. He was also a great chef. You know, uh-huh. we, we, we would, he would cook us dinner every night and he'd always do something really fun and really, you know, he'd do it well, you know, and he taught himself how to cook. And that was always really cool. So, I mean, he was, like I said, he was a pretty gentle guy, you know, in at heart. And, you know, he liked gardening, you know, he was, he was into that and he was, he was proud about all this stuff. You know, he never hid it or anything. He ever said, you know, he never said, don't tell anybody that I, you know, I do it. He's, he was proud of it. You know, he was, uh, he was his own man. And I always appreciate that because anything I do, I'm proud of what I do. So I, I get it. So that was pretty cool. 
what was Chuck's uh, Chuck's best uh, dish? What was what, what was he known for? Was there any particular ribs, burgers? He, all of it. Like he could make a lasagna like nobody's business. Oh wow! And the one thing he liked to do a lot is he was really good at. Uh, he had just picked up a uh, one of those. I don't even know what they are. The air dryers, kind of the de- de- dehumidifier. He would. He he would make his own beef jerky, and man, oh, wow. we would go to town on that. He was really really good at you know marinating the the meat for you know a couple of days, and then putting it on the the jerky making machine, <laughs> you know whatever that thing was, you know just a, a dehydration machine. So uh, yeah, it was, he would always you know it's it all goes into the sauce and the cut of meat, I guess. And he was really good at that, definitely. You know, but at the time, I remember when 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 we first. When I when I landed uh, for the individual thought patterns, like putting together of the record, the the sessions, um, the first thing he noticed is, hey, Chi, I see you're you've lost quite a bit of weight, and I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to get a little healthy and all that sort of stuff. And I remember, you know, we were sitting at dinner, and he was, you know, patted his own stomach. Chuck was always thin, <laughs> you know, thin, slim guy, and he's like, you know what, I could stand to lose a few pounds. Tell you what, I'll cook us, you know. I'll cook us some really healthy stuff all the time because I explained to him what I was trying to do at the time. And he's like, I, I can cook like that. Sure. No problem. And and I'll, I'll take care of us while we're here. And sure enough, he did, you know, like we were wow. jamming hard in the sweaty sweat box that is Florida and, you know, lose dropping a lot of pounds. And Chuck was a, was a good facilitator of that with the way that he, he cooked. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, great to hear some uh, insights on Chuck as an individual and, you know, uh, looking uh, beyond death to all uh, Metalocalypse and Death Clock and still doing that. Right. Yeah, we um, we just finished a, a pair of tours over the past few months. Came through uh, the eye. La- right. That's we sure did. Yeah, we just played Riverside. Riverside. Yeah, Talked that's to- right, though. Talked to Brendan before that tour. That was great. Oh, kick ass. Awesome. Yeah, that's always a blast. You know, Death Clock is such a such a blast. And yeah, we did play play in Riverside there. And we played that place that was right across from like the mission sort of thing. I remember visiting there with my family. My wife and I went out there one time. They were right across the street. And I was like, yeah. oh, I, I recognize that place. Very interesting building right across from the venue that we played. I didn't get a chance to go catch it. But uh, yeah, very cool. Very cool history of, of that area of California. Darn tootin'. And more Death Clock material, tour, music coming? I would imagine so. I know there's 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 rumblings of things coming up. And I, I would imagine that at some point, you know, I, I, I know Brendan's very into being on the road. And there's a lot of questions that are probably better answered by Brendan about the future of Death Clock. But we definitely talked about, you know, he's... There's, if there is a window currently for Death Clock, Brendan is all about exploring that window of opportunities and what we could possibly do. So, um, you know, that's always exciting. And and I'm sure when there is, you know, if, if there's something definite coming up, you guys will be the first to know. Absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's a, a number of things that I'm also involved in, like, for instance, um, you know, like right after that death clock run that we just finished, um, I, I we did a gig with Bear McCreary and Bear McCreary's record just came out about a month ago. And for those who may be familiar with his name, you you would recognize that he Bear is the the composer of all the music for The Walking Dead oh. and um Amazon's Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, um, the the Lord of the Rings show that's on Amazon right now. And he's also he does a lot of movie soundtracks, movie scores. We worked on the the Godzilla King of the Monsters movie together um, a few years back. We did a track for the for the closing credits. We did a cover of Godzilla by Blue Oyster Cult. That was always fun. And Bear has an album called The Singularity. And this album, I strongly suggest everybody check out, you know, for for fans of, of like, for instance, mine that are into like the strapping young lads and the death clock and the Devin Townsend sort of bombastic kind of 
kick-ass metal it's it's in that sort of vein but just the list of guest stars on this thing is is pretty mind-boggling and everybody stepped up on it and it is a it's a crushing record you know it's got a ton of great guests on it and bear wrote wrote a fantastic it's not only a a hard metal record but it just runs the gamut from all styles of music and so i i suggest folks check out the singularity that's pretty darn kick-ass dude i'm definitely going to check that out when we get done here gene i appreciate all the time I've got one more question for you one more thing i need yes, your help sir. we're an old school radio station we do a feature called mandatory metallic every night at 10 p.m which you're going to be a part of and that's I've been having this little uh, Metallica debate, which I want to get your pick on going back to their early years their thrashy years and debating with my buddy. We're kind of going back and forth their best thrash metal album ever and have narrowed it down to ride the lightning versus master of puppets. If you had to choose one out of those two, which one would it be for you? A flat out ride the lightning of those two. And oh. I would go, I would take that back even further to the, the demo for ride the lightning. Um, they they put out a four track demo in '84, and we were able to get our hands on it. We we weren't supposed to, but we were able to get our our hands on that thing. And hearing how they were evolving, there were it was a four track demo, and I believe that demo has been released on some of the the you know the the remastered and the reissues of Ride the Lightning. Definitely check that four four track demo out. It kicks off with Ride the Lightning. And a little different intro to it. You know, they ah. hadn't quite worked out the nice, pretty, uh, you know, 12 string guitar on it. But I mean, ride, uh, fight fire with fire. I mean, um, fight fire with fire. I, that was a pretty vicious song. You know, you're like, wow, okay, Metallica's, they're stepping it up, you know, and the vocals were killer. James was crushing. And then the second track on that demo, and this was all like just live off the floor wow. kind of thing where they were crushing it. Lars was crushing it on, on this demo. Like, like they're, you know, he, he kicked ass on it. You know, the double bass was killer on ride the light. I'm, I'm sorry. On, on, on both songs. Yeah. On fight fire with fire, ride the lightning. He was, he was great drumming. It's a great sounding live off the floor sort of demo. You hear like, you know, like, them kind of laughing in between takes and stuff and then there was this bad ass version of creeping death on it that it had a little more energy than than the album version did and i think lars was kind of pumping the double basses through you know remember this was a cassette so we were trying to hear what we could off it and then they had the song um when hell freezes over which uh -huh. eventually turned into the call of cthulhu but yeah, man, that was that was really exciting. And then when when Ride the Lightning came out, that was the benchmark for thrash metal productions at the time, you know, because uh, a number of bands were were starting to release records by then. You know, you had obviously, you know, Slayer's Show No Mercy was the second thrash metal album ever. Slayer was releasing things like you know the the Haunting the Chapel, yeah. um, but you were involved EP. In and indeed, yeah, to, to a tiny, tiny degree. But, um, you know, a lot of bands were coming out by then. You know, you had your Destructions and your Creators and your Dark Angels and, you know, Hyrax from L.A. and a number of just bands all over the world, Sodom, you know, that were releasing material. And this was getting to be really exciting. You know, Voivod from Canada, you you name it. I'm just, I'm, there's a million more bands. Artillery from Denmark. You know, a lot of bands were starting to get their material out there at the time and all the demos and things like that and it was a very exciting magical time for metal i found and you know metallica obviously the the godfathers of it all you know and and you know i i definitely include dave mustaine and that you know he's a godfather of thrash metal absolutely definitely you know so there you go yeah crazy all 40 years ago crazy that ride the lightning is now 40 years old this year Holy moly. God, I never thought of that, but shoot, man, look at that. And it's as timeless today as it was back then, you know, such an exciting record and you know, we'll let them, we'll let them get away with that song escape. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that I get it. That song always just kind of reminded me of an Aussie type song. It sounded kind of like Aussie, like the chorus. I was like, yeah, man, it's a little bit Aussie-esque. Okay. 
You know, and I, you know, a lot of folks were shocked when they put out, you know, fade to black. Uh oh, a ballad. What the hell? Already? You know, you you save a ballad for your sixth record. What are you guys doing? But shit, man, it was two cares. It was a killer record, totally. Now the the hard part, you just got to pick a song for us to play for you on Mandatory Metallica. What can, what Metallica tune can we play for you? Can I? Uh, do we have to go directly off that record, or can anything, you anything access? Like from that album oh shoot well then definitely man turn people on to let's oh anything off that demo but i my first choice is creeping death but um definitely fight fire with fire from that i'm like i know there's a number of demos on the uh, on, on that got released like certain areas of demos but you cannot go wrong with fight fire with fire holy moly you know we make holes in teeth totally <laughs> beautiful man thank you so much for the time honor to get to talk to you and hopefully thank i'll you, see you there at the la shows i hope to see you absolutely man come on out we're gonna have a blast totally thank you so much gene Pleasure. thank you mike we'll see have you take buddy. care bye-bye you too bye-bye